and get the recording started. Okay, so welcome to the session. Uh, that's the semester test two uh, preparation session. So where we're going to start off, I would just like first all of you, um, if you haven't done so as yet, can you please just click on the link uh, that I've shared in the messaging, uh, this Google Docs link. Um, and just uh, quickly fill in uh, a, it should be a relatively short survey. Um, and the survey is just uh, feedback on uh, the work done up until now. Uh, I want to get a feeling of what the uh, general view is on the lectures, uh, the tutorials, as well as the practicals. Just please take note, this is, uh, it's not a feel good survey. I want to see effectively where the small or even medium large problem areas are that may need improvement. Uh, some of you indicated to me that, uh, you know, you maybe were not too happy with the tutorials or the practicals or maybe even the classes that I'm conducting, you know, just please indicate so that we can, um, you know, with the part of the semester that's left, we can actually work on addressing those. Okay. So, yeah, please just uh, fill that in so long. Um, and then we are, I want to start in the uh, next five minutes. So I'm going to give you some time to fill that, that in. And then, uh, yeah, at uh, 20 past, we're going to look at, uh, I want to look at the performance for semester test one. Um, I think it's important that we talk about that as well. I didn't get a chance to talk about that because we were, you know, obviously jumping into work that we need to do for semester test two. Um, so I'll just give you a moment to fill in that review. And then uh, we can just look at performance and then we can jump straight into uh, straight into the, the test. Okay, while you're filling that in, uh, if there are questions, you can uh, raise your hand. We are going to be going through the two semester tests that I have put up on ULINK. So that's the 2020 semester test. I think the other one is the 2017 or 18 semester test. I indicated that in the announcements. So um, my expectation was that you guys make sure that you have gone through at least that paper and you and you know what you don't know. Um, you know, whatever you have, uh, whatever you don't understand, you you are able to, um, you know, clearly articulate so that we can actually go through it. So we're going to go through those two papers. After that, I will, I think between 7 and 7.30, uh, we will then be uh, going through, we will then be going through the, um, well, I'll be taking questions, basically. So I, I, I think just after 7, we should be done. We'll be going through questions. So specific questions that you have, you can then ask. Um, there were some of you that emailed me um, with particular questions. I said in the email response that uh, you joined the session. Uh, and then after we're done with the papers, you can ask the specific questions that you have. Um, El Mayongo says, sir, could you please upload the memo of the 2018 semester test two. Okay, so we're gonna do the, the work anyway. So the, the point of this is to effectively create a memo, if I can put it like that. So um, after, after the session, you should have that information.
Okay. Uh, one of you has um, asked about additional um, uh, papers for rough work during your tests. Okay, so should you need um, additional paper uh, for rough work? Uh, do, do indicate so. So what we'll do this time around is that we will, there's, there are usually booklets that you can use. Uh, and what we'll do is to just, uh, just bring some of those booklets so that if you need, to, if you need it for rough work, you can then just, uh, you know, pick your hand up and, and ask for it for rough work. Um, I'll make note of that so that we can make that available. Okay, I think let's move on. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so uh, what I want us to quickly take a look at is uh, the performance of semester test one, because I need all of you, all those of you that have attended this, I uh, see there's about 150 of you, which is less than half of the class. Um, that I'm hoping it's the class that needs this, that is actually, or the part that needs this, that is actually attending. But um, there were 315 students that wrote. And of the 315 students that wrote, um, the, the class average for test one is 48.30%, uh, uh, which is uh, low uh, to my expectation. Uh, it shouldn't be sitting at this point. Uh, at, at this point. Uh, there's 143 students that passed. The pass rate is 45.4%. Uh, there's 172 students that failed. And remember that a fail is any mark that's below 50%, right? So there's 172 students that failed this test. I think more alarming for me is that um, a lot of these students are sitting between zero and 39%, um, which means you wouldn't even qualify to write the exam with the mark that you got. Um, so if you're sitting in this region, you need to ensure that you have made effort for this next test that is coming because you need to pass that test and you need to pass that test well and most likely you'll need to write the third test to make up for the low semester uh, test one that you've received okay there is uh, 70 students that are sitting between 40 and 49 percent i suppose that's relatively better but it's still not a pass and those students need to uh, focus, I would really advise that you need to push to ensure that you get your second semester mark at least sitting above 55% to 60%. Um, there's 39 students that got between 59 and 50 and 59%, good for that. 60 to 74%, there's, 30, there's 72 students, that's great. And uh, so there's 32 students that uh, got uh, distinctions uh, for that first test. So well done to all of you that uh, 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 got uh, the marks above 75%. Uh, keep it up. I think the, these are the top five marks, so ranging from uh, nine, from 86% to two joint top students uh, that were sitting on 91%. All right. So this is the, uh, the the statistics of your first test that you wrote, and these statistics need to improve. The quality of the paper is not going to get easier. Um, uh, what needs to change is the effort that's being put in. And all of you need to understand that you can't half complete a problem. You can't do problems and not put units. There's a lot of ridiculous areas that you guys lost marks, simple marks, easy marks, and it's going to happen again. The marking is not going to change. The level of the paper is going to get more difficult. What needs to change is your effort and ensuring that you're getting the answers completely correct. I think I pointed to all of you that 
here you either know what's going on or you don't know what's going on. That's why there's very little students that are sitting in the 40 to 49 and you know 50 to 59 regions right you're either knowing what's going on you're you're above you know you're above uh, 60 and above or you don't know what's going on you're between 0 and 39 and this is not going to change right so you need to make sure that you're approaching this um, module and the paper that you're writing such that you fully know what's going on you lose you know about 80 percent of the marks if you're not getting the answers right which are reflecting that you know what's going on Okay, so that's my uh, feedback on test one. Let's, uh, let's get into test two. All right, I think what we'll do is uh, let's start with uh, um, all of you should have the, this one is pretty much a memo, so it's giving you the answers for this one, right? So I think what we'll do is uh, is to start with the, the one that you didn't have solutions for. So that would be the 2018 test two. 
and there's a couple of questions here that are um, that are applicable um, not everything but a couple of questions that would be applicable all right so question one says determine the equivalent resistance to the right of terminals a b using star delta transformations 1.1.1 1.1.2 says determine the current um, flowing here and then uh, yeah, so this is all semester test one work. So you've covered this already. So this is not really relevant for this test. Um, 1.2 talks about uh, using uh, the superposition principle of theorem to determine the vote that you know the the, um, the currents flowing through I1, I2, and I3. Again, you've used this already in we've done superposition in test one, so that won't be applicable to you. Okay, now um, this question, uh, question two, is where we're going to start. So the question states, determine the Thevenin equivalent uh, with respect to terminals A, B. Okay, so that's the that's the, that's the circuit point that we're going to start. I'm going to uh, snip this. Okay, so the question reads, determine the Thevenin equivalent with respect to terminals A, B. And what does Thevenin equivalent mean? What does that mean when they say Thevenin equivalent? So you should know that you will be asked for the Thevenin equivalent voltage. Um, you will be asked for the Thevenin equivalent resistance. And then you will be asked for the Thevenin equivalent, which implies that you must get the voltage as well as the resistance. Just a moment. Okay. So when they ask you for the Thevenin equivalent, uh, keep in mind that they're saying the Thevenin equivalent voltage as well as the Thevenin equivalent resistance. Right. That's why the mark allocation that you can see there, that it's, it's quite a lot of marks that have been given for that question. Okay. And if they are asking for those two um, quantities, um, I would always start off as we, you know, start off as we've indicated in class. So the first thing is start with RTH, right? RTH is usually the simpler, right? With RTH, you should know that your voltage, uh, VTH, uh, or your voltage sources, your independent voltage sources are supposed to be short circuits and your independent current sources are supposed to be open circuits right you've got a, a dc source sign there so that is the same as um so i'm going to say that just just for knowledge purposes that is the same as something that looks like that right um as nine volts that's exactly the same thing okay so let us uh let us uh, do RTH. So you know now that your voltage source will become a short circuit. So what you're going to do is you're going to uh, replace this with a short circuit. You're going to replace that with a short circuit and you will then have the circuit looking something like that. Yeah. And you've been informed in this problem that the 2 ohm resistor is a load resistor, right? This is critical because then you know that when you're determining the Thevenin equivalent, it, it's with respect to the load resistor. So you cannot include the load resistor. Okay. If they hadn't pointed out here that this is a load resistor, then you would have had to include it in the calculation um, if this load was not here but they've indicated that it's a load resistor, so you take it out of your calculation, right? So you've got five ohms, you've got three ohms, you've got 10 ohms, you've got seven ohms. 
and you um, calculate your equivalent resistance, right? You check what's in series, what's in parallel. And how do you do this? Um, if you're not sure, as we've done many times in class, I say inject a current into your node terminal A and then see what happens to that current. That current goes in here. It will split like that. That current will go like that. So you can see that the same current going in here is going out of here. So the 5 ohm and the 3 ohm are in series with each other. But then the combination of that will be in parallel with the 10 ohms, right? And that should help you to determine what the equivalent resistance will be. So RTH should be 5 ohms uh, plus 3 ohms. And that should be in parallel with the 10 ohms. And all of this should be in series with the 7 ohms. Okay, so that is 8 in parallel with 10 plus 7. All right, so that's 8 in parallel with 10. plus 7. Okay, and I get a value of 11.4 ohms. Okay, now let's quickly check if there's any questions in that regard. Yeah, correct. So I see most of you have calculated that, or at least some of you have calculated that, 11.44 ohms. Good. Well done on that. Um, so that is your um, equivalent resistance. Okay. And that's easy. It should be easy. Um, that should be an easy calculation, easy marks that you're getting. The second part of this is to then calculate the VTH which is your feminine equivalent voltage. So VTH is your feminine equivalent voltage, right? What are you going to do in order for you to calculate this, uh, uh, this VTH value? All right, so uh, Kumalo, you've got your hand up. I trust it's got to do with the previous question. Uh, go ahead. Kumalo, go ahead. Okay, I'm going to continue. All right, the second part of the question is to determine VTH. Okay, so there's your, uh, your, your original diagram, right? And you should know what VTH is by definition VTH. VTH right is equals to the maximum voltage over your load resistor which is your open circuit voltage that means your load resistor must become an open circuit for you to get the maximum voltage over that load resistor and this is why we then take out the load resistor and we replace it with an open circuit Right, and that would be, I think that was terminals A and B, right? So there's your terminal A and there's your terminal B. So that would be plus minus VAB, which is equals to VTH. So you are looking for <coughs> the voltage from point A to B. And again, we've done similar problems like this where the philosophy won't change. VAB is going to give me VA minus VB, right? You should see that the value of VB, if you put your ground node there, VB should give you zero volts. So VAB will actually give you VA. So the voltage at this point, right, will then give you the voltage VTH. 
but what is um, the, or, or rather, is there any current flowing through here? You should see that the current there will equal to zero because the current will flow in that direction. So all of the current going in here will go down there and the current I will equal to zero, which then means that the voltage here will also equal to zero. There's no voltage drop across the seven ohm resistor. So the voltage here will still be VA. Okay. Um, so this will still be plus minus VAB effectively across this 10 ohm resistor. So the VA, which was there, is the same as the VA, which is at this point. The VB, which is here, is the same as the VB, which is at this point, which is zero. Right, that's zero then. So the 10, if you look at the 10 ohm resistor, you can get the voltage VAB. And that's really the knowledge of circuit analysis, understanding that the Thevenin equivalent translates to the voltage across the 10 ohm resistor. Once you know that, VAB, which is going to be the voltage of the 10 ohm resistor, that should be quite simple. Um, you can use voltage division, right? 10 over 10 plus 3 plus 5 multiplied by 9. So that will be 90 over 10 plus 8, which is 18, right? So that's 90 over 18. And I get a value of 5 volts. see what you guys got okay good I see um, you guys are getting five volts okay someone is asking can you please explain how to calculate VTH when we have a voltage source on an open circuit okay so remember something about an open circuit is that an open circuit there's no current flowing through the open circuit so effectively, what you have here is a source. If, if I can redraw the circuit for you, right? You've got basically something that looks like this. And you've got that, and you've got that, and you've got that. That's effectively what you have here. Um, so that's 9 volts, right? That's your 10 ohms. That's your 3 ohms, and that's your 5 ohms. OK. So an open circuit doesn't impact your, your you know, the, the flow of, of your, you know, current or the dynamic of your circuit, right? This is what you have, a series circuit, basically. And whatever you would have calculated here in the circuit for voltage division is exactly the same as what, what you see here. So these points become irrelevant. They're just reference points. Like if I were to take a multimeter and put something here, on the positive side and put something here on the negative side, right? Doesn't impact my circuit. It's just a it's just a point that's not really close. The only time it impacts the circuit is when I close the circuit. If I were to short A to B, then it will impact my circuit. Okay, I hope that answers the question that you're asking. All right, so let's go back to the question. Thevenin equivalent. So the Thevenin equivalent, uh, you, you've uh, determined the Thevenin equivalent. You've got the Thevenin equivalent voltage. You've got the Thevenin equivalent resistance. Okay, you've, yeah, you've got the Thevenin equivalent voltage. You've got the Thevenin equivalent resistance, right? What about Norton? Right, you should know that once you've done, once you've gone through a method or a lengthy method to get the Thevenin equivalent voltage. You use Ohm's law or source transformation to say the Norton equivalent current is going to give you the Thevenin equivalent voltage divided by your Thevenin equivalent resistance. So that will be 5 divided by 11.44. And that will give you a Norton equivalent current. So 5 divided by 11.44. And that will give you a value of 0 0.437. So I'm going to say 0 0.44 gives you a value of 0, 0,44 amps. OK. And typically, they haven't asked us in this question, but it, it usually gets asked. I ask it. They will say, determine your equivalent circuit. So what would your equivalent circuit be? Your equivalent circuit would be 
a thevenin uh, equivalent voltage in series with your thevenin equivalent resistance, right? So that would be VTH, and this will be RTH. And if you have Yeah, that will be VTH and RTH. And then what you can do is you can connect your load resistor, which in this case was equal to um, the, uh, the 2 ohm. OK, but again, I think what you what you may need to do is uh, is this actually because remember your feminine equivalent resistance is when your load resistor is an open circuit in that case okay so that's vth you'll say vth is equals to five volts you say rth is equals to 11.4 ohms okay and typically you will get a mark for that and you will get a mark for that or if it's out of one mark you get one mark for the complete uh, circuit indication Right, let's take a look at uh, some questions. Okay, so someone's asked, can we use the thevenin equivalent steps to find Norton? So I've, I think we've we covered that. Use Ohm's law. Um, uh, IN is VTH over RTH. Uh, you'll get that. Um, someone is asking, why are we not including the 2 ohm resistor when calculating the Norton current? Okay, uh, that is because of the definition of the Norton current. Okay, and let's, for the sake of um, illustration, we're going to determine the Norton current, not using Thevenin, but we're going to determine the Norton current, and we should still get that 0 0.44. Okay, if the voltage direction is in the direction of VTH, um, then you add, but if okay, someone is answering there, okay, let me just see the, the hands. Okay, I think it's Dreezy G. You can ask your question. Mr. Sula, about the three ohm okay, about the three ohm resistor, why do we don't do we consider it because there's, there's a ground node there? The three ohm resistor, do we consider it because? Why do we consider it because there's a ground node and there's the, the ground node does put potential difference of uh there is, there is, it's supposed to be zero, right? Uh, not exactly. Why? Remember something. Uh, so um, what you're saying is partially correct, but not completely correct. When you have, so, so this is your ground node, right? You see, you see where I'm highlighting here? Yeah. That's, your, that's, that's your ground node, right? Anything yes, connected to this point is zero. Okay, so that's zero up until the bottom of this 10 ohm, all the way to VB will be zero, all the way to the bottom to this part, only this part, only this part of the, um, you know, of the three ohm resistor would be zero. Okay, but on the other side of this, it's no longer zero. So this is not zero anymore. Um, because there is a current flowing through therefore there will be a voltage drop across this there will be a voltage drop across the 5 ohm there will be a voltage drop across the 10 ohm right what is a bit strange about this question which you may have not dealt with before is when you have a resistor between a point of zero potential and a um, another source that's coming in right so what actually happens here what happens here is that the voltage drops, it takes the, 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 the value to negative. Let's say, um, well, we, we know the, the current, right? The current was 0 0.44, right? If you take 0 0.44, you multiply it by 3, 4, whatever. So the voltage here is 1.2 volts, effectively, okay? So what is happening here? You, you start off at 0, you drop by 1.2 volts. So the voltage at this point is not 0, it is negative 1.2 volts. That's the voltage at this point. 
and then you increase by nine. So minus 1.2 plus nine is basically nine minus 1.2, which is, um, I think it's 7.8, um, right? So the voltage at this point is 7.8, right? And then from 7.8, you decrease by five times 0 0.44 to get to another voltage. And then again, you decrease by 10 times 0 0.44 to get back to zero. Okay, I hope that is clear. Uh, it's clear, sir. Okay, great. Uh, Matebula, you can ask a question. Um, sir, so I wanted to ask about the Norton equivalent. Okay, let's take a look at the Norton equivalent. I see someone is also asking, why don't we draw the Norton equivalent? The reason why you don't draw the Norton equivalent is that they didn't ask you to draw the Norton equivalent. They talked about the Thevenin equivalent. Okay, so we've partially actually answered, um, we've, we've answered 2.1. We talked about the Thevenin equivalent. So this is the Thevenin equivalent circuits, VTH and RTH. Okay, now the second part now would be Norton equivalent. So 2.2. .2. Um, let's uh, quickly erase this, let's get the red part. Okay, so l let me look at 2.2, .2, which is the Norton equivalent. Some of you have asked this. Right, if I were to um, determine, I mean, if, if I'm asked a question in this manner and they talk about the Norton equivalent, right? If I've spent the, 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 the long way to calculate the Thevenin equivalent, I'm definitely going to just use um, uh, what's this thing? Uh, Ohm's law to get Norton equivalent. But I don't have to go use the long method again to get the Norton equivalent, right? But for the sake of illustration, let's use the long method. And what what will that method uh, look like? So, effectively, I will be. Uh, let me take this. So I need that. Okay, so um, we are now going to look for the Norton equivalent current. Okay, now someone asked, why did we not use the two ohm resistor to determine the Norton equivalent current? That two ohm load resistor when we determine the Norton equivalent current. So take a look at what we're doing here so that you can see the relevance of not including that. What is the Norton equivalent current? It's the maximum current over the load resistor. When does this occur? This, uh, this is also known as the short circuit current. So what, what happens? It means that your load resistor must become a short circuit. That is the only condition that will result in you having a Norton equivalent current, which is defined as the maximum current over the load resistor. Okay, so you need to take the load resistor and replace it with a short circuit. A short circuit is zero ohms. Zero ohms means maximum um, current that will flow. Current is uh, inversely proportional to resistance. All right, so there's my replacement of my, um, there's my replacement of my uh, load resistor with a short circuit. Okay. Okay, good. Um, right. So now what are we looking for? We're looking for this current I N. Okay. And how are we going to find the current? I mean, we're quite simply going to be doing uh, your your your, your um, KCL or KVL. I'll choose to do KCL in this case. I'm going to say the current that flows there is going to go down and it's going to go across like that. So that's my choice. And obviously this must be I N flowing there. I also need another unknown. So I'm going to call this V as the unknown. Okay. I'll call this I1. I'll call this I2. So I'm going to say KCL node V says I1 
will equal I2 plus I0. What is I1? I1 is the voltage before, which is 9 volts minus V over 5. Plus, or not plus, is equal to um, the current after. I2 is V minus 0 over 10 plus V minus 0 over 7. And I solve. Okay, so 9 minus V over 5 is going to give me uh, V over 10 plus the unknown is V over 7. Okay, 4.06 tells me the voltage is 4.06. So V is equals to 4,06 volts. Okay. And if I'm looking for IN, I should then know that IN is going to give me V minus zero divided by seven, which is four comma zero six divided by seven. Let's see what that gives us. Nine minus V over five. V of 10 plus that. Um, so there's a question here that says, will the current also go through the 10 ohm? Well, yes, there will be current that goes through the 10 ohm um, because the 10 ohm is connected to the circuit. I just want to quickly check something. Uh, it's just recalculating this. So this would be... Yeah, so this is, uh, the voltage is correct. It's 4,06. Um, just want to check something. Voltage minus voltage just gives you that. Minus the zero. Oh, okay, all right. My, uh, there's, a, there's a mistake here. Okay, so what is the error here? The error here is the following. We've said the voltage at this point is 9, right? And that's why the numbers are not making sense. We've said the voltage at this point is 9, right? And is this the case? This is actually not the case because when we were running through this, we, we, we discussed, we said that's 0, then it drops by minus 1.2, right? And then it raises to 7.8. So the voltage there is not actually 9, it's 7.8. If you want to use the voltage there as 9, then you would need to take the resistor above this point. Then you know that that is still 0 and it increases by 9. So what you would need to do, um, and I'm just going to erase this, because that's where the, the issue actually came. Um, you would need to say, well, all of these are connected in series, so I can put this resistor above the 9 volt. It doesn't matter. 
because everything is connected in series. So I can then say, um, there's your voltage source. Okay, and that is zero. That is nine volts. So definitely now the voltage at this point will be positive nine. But then you will have your three ohm and you will have your nine ohm uh, resistor that sits there, three and five rather. You'll have your three ohm and you'll have your five ohm resistor that sits there. You'll have your 10 ohm resistor there and you will have um, your short circuit that sits at that point and your seven ohm resistor. So seven ohm resistor that sits there. Okay, and you're looking for the current that flows there and you've got the V unknown there. So then you will say um, the voltage going in there, which is I1, and we said this is I2, and we said this is IN. So I1 is equals to I2 plus IN. And I1 will be, now it will be the voltage before, which is 9, correct, minus the voltage after, which is V. And the resistance will be the addition of the two, which is 3 plus 5. And then we're going to say that's equal to um, V minus 0 over 10 plus V minus 0 over 7. Okay. So the only difference here is that um, the denominator is now going to be 5 plus 3, which is 8, and not, um, and not the initial 5. Okay. And then I get a value of 3,058. Okay, so I've got here V is equals to 3,058 volts. And then IN, which is going to give me V over 7, is going to give me 3,058 divided by 7, which gives me 0, 0,436 which is 0,44 amps. Okay, and that's our Norton equivalent. Right. And obviously, if you took this method, then you can say VTH is therefore equal to I Norton multiplied by R Norton or I Norton multiplied by RTH, which is going to give me 0,44 multiplied by 11.44 and that should then give you 5 volts and if they asked for the Norton equivalent this is now where you would put the Norton equivalent circuit if they had asked you for a Norton analysis so that is then going to be your Norton current and in parallel with that should be your Norton resistance Okay, which will then be connected to your load resistor. Okay. And this is also fine. You, you can actually um, uh, put the load resistor there if you wanted to as well. It's not really an issue. Okay, so you can put the load resistor there as well. It's not an issue. Um, uh, because you will then indicate that um, you can just say RL there and you know that RL will be a short circuit for you to get I Norton etc okay so that's the uh, the first two parts of that question Mujapelo um, um, you've got your hand up you can ask your question 
Um, so I wanted to ask if whether we should draw like the final circuits at the end of each question. If they ask for you to draw it. So if don't if they don't ask, I shouldn't draw them, or should I draw them just in case? I mean, you can draw it if you want to, uh, but the, the the critical thing is that do not avoid drawing it if they've asked for it. Typically, with the questions, they will say. Uh, draw the Norton equivalent circuit or draw the Thevenin equivalent circuit and then you need to draw it. Um, okay, so thanks. All right. Good. Let's uh, continue to the next part of this. Uh, the load current through the two ohm resistor. Okay, so what is the load current uh, through the two ohm resistor? Okay, so now the question is, here's your circuit now, and you've got a, you've got your Norton equivalent current, which you said is 0 0.44 amps. You've got your Norton equivalent resistance, which you've said is, um, uh, 11.44 Norton is equals to seven, right? And you've got your load resistor, which is your two ohm resistor. So how will you now determine the current through the load? And that's 2.3. So 2.3, the current through the load resistor, IL, that should be relatively simple as well, because you're just looking for this current, right? You can use current division. Then. So you can see the current through the load is the Norton resistance over the Norton resistance plus the um, load resistance. And then you multiply all of this by 0 0.44, which is your Norton current. So that will be 0 0.44 multiplied by um, the Norton resistance uh, is 11.44 over 11.44 plus 2. And I get 0 0.37. Okay. And what you do is you need to have a bit of a sanity check on this, right? Um, and what is the sanity check that you do for yourself? You ask yourself, you need to always check that uh, the, the least resistance must have the most current. 0 0.37 amps, right? So I'm expecting the 2 ohm resistor to have uh, much more current than the 11 ohm resistor. 0 0.44 amps is available, and 0 0.37 of those amps is going to the load resistor, and the remainder goes there. And that 0 0.37 is the majority. So that's my sanity check. So I know I've calculated correctly. If you mixed this and you found that it was 0 .01, you know, then you should know that, well, this is a small resistor. It should have more current, the most of this current that's coming in here. So that's your sanity check. OK, what's the next question? Uh, 2.4 says determine the, what is the load current. And then they say determine the new load current if the resistance is increased to five ohms. Okay, so that should again be quite simple. Nothing pretty much has changed. All that we're saying now is that um, with 2.4, RL becomes five ohms. Then we still, the equation will still be the same. So the load resistor is just going to be the new five ohms now. So it will be five over five plus two multiplied by the load resist the load current which is uh, 0 0.44 right it the resistance has now the load resistance has now increased so we're expecting the current through it to decrease okay so we've got five um is it five or n or n it's not five exactly it should be the other way around right it should be it's Rn, which is going to be 
and they've said the load they've said here that the load resistor is the one that changes just to double check if the load resistance is increased to 5 ohms okay so the load resistance is increased to 5 ohms right so this resistance gets larger which means less current will flow through that load resistance so we're expecting the current to be less than that 0.37 amps so it will still be that 11.44 over now it will be 5 plus 11.44 right so it will be 11.44 over 5 plus 11.44 multiplied by the current of 0 0.44 Okay, and I get 0 0.306. Okay, that's what that's the final answer. There. So you can see the current has reduced. All right, good. Um, that should be the that should be that with that question. So you uh, you should be in a position where you are now clear on how to address this particular question. The next question says uh, you've got a first order differential equation. So this is a chapter six question. So let's take a look at this. So that's the next question. You're given a first order differential equation um, and they've asked you to determine uh, and you, you should be able to, to look at the circuit and um, it's a first order. Um, you've got an inductor in the circuit and they are asking you to determine the current through the inductor as a function of time. All right, um, so it's just under DC conditions. So they're asking you to determine the current through the inductor function of time. So you should first determine whether this is a source free step response, what type of a circuit is this, uh, determine the initial uh, current through the inductor, the Thevenin equivalent resistance, the time constant, and then the final expression for the current as a function of time. Okay, so. I'm going to give you guys five minutes to take a look at this. I want you to make an uh, to just uh, well make an effort to go through it, and then we can uh, discuss it.
Okay, um, just uh, check uh, the power went off and the backup went on. I just want to check if all of you can still hear me. We can still hear you, sir. Okay, great stuff. Okay, let's get to it. So the first part of the question here says, determine the initial current through the inductor. Okay, so again, I think this is a, in, in your test, it'll probably be sitting at about uh, six to eight marks, this question, uh, this overall question. Um, actually, up to, it will go up to 10 marks, actually. Um, so the first part says the initial current through the inductor. What do you need to know here? Uh, you should be able to see that when the circuit opens, the source is no longer connected to the part of the circuit that has the inductor, and that's the part where you're going to have the response. So this is a source-free RL circuit. Right, that's the first thing, source-free RL circuit. So given that it's a source-free RL circuit, I'm expecting a response that will look something like this. Right? And that would be the current through the inductor as a function of time. And I need to get things such as the time constant and the overall expression of the, the current through the inductor. And I am expecting this response. Okay, so what's the first thing? It's a, it's, it's a current response, so I should know it's a source free. So the current through the inductor as a function of time is going to give me I0 e to the negative t over tau, where tau is equals to L over R, which is my equivalent inductance over my equivalent resistance. Okay, the I0 is going to give me the current just as you have opened the circuit, zero positive, which should be the same as the current just before I, 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 um, I open that circuit because the current in an inductor does not change abruptly. So I can get that current. So when T is equals to zero negative, what happens? So when T is equals to zero negative, the circuit is closed. And I've got the inductor, which under DC conditions is a short circuit. And I've got my 8 ohm resistor, my 4 ohm resistor, and my 3 ohm resistor. And I'm looking for this current, which is going to be I of 0 negative. And that's the 24 volts. Okay, so how will I find that? Um, I can, I'm just quite simply here going to do a KCL. I'm going to say the current that goes there gives me that current plus that current. And I'm going to put that as a V. So I'm going to say I1, I2, and I3. So I1 equals I2 plus I3. And what is I1? It will be 24 volts. So obviously this time around you can see that's a ground point. So the voltage here is positive 24. So it will be 24 volts minus V over 3 equals V minus 0 over 4, that's over here, plus V minus 0 over 8. And this is the I0 negative that we're looking for. But we need to solve for V first. Okay, so let's calculate that. So we say 24 minus
Okay, and I get 11.29. Right, and therefore, I0 is going to give me 11.29 divided by 8. And that gives me 1.41 amps. That's my initial current. That was the first part, <coughs> three months. 7 in equivalent resistance. So now we focus now when T is greater than 0. So I always say, draw your circuit so that you know what's going on. So T greater than 0, what you have is a um, an inductor and two resistors, 4 and 8. So there's your, there's your resistor, there's your inductor, and there's your other resistor. That's 4 ohms, that's 8 ohms, and the inductance value is 4 henrys. Okay, now we're looking for, when T is greater than 0, a time constant which is L over R, which is going to be L equivalent over R equivalent, and R equivalent is RTH. So L equivalent should be basic, it's 4 henrys because there's no other inductor. R equivalent, which is equals to RTH, what do we do? You look at the equivalent resistance with respect to where the, um, the inductance, the inductor would be connected, because that's where you're getting your response. So you can take that out so that you don't confuse yourself. And you've got a 4 and you've got an 8, right? Um, how are those connected? If you don't know, you inject a current like we do with RTH, and you can see that if you put a current there, that current will be the same current coming out of there. So that is in series. So R equivalent is going to give me 8 plus 4, which then gives me 12 ohms. And therefore, um, tau, which is equals to L over R, is going to give me um, 4 divided by 12, uh, which then gives me, I think it's 0 0.3. So 4 divided by 12 is 0 0.33. So that's going to give me 0 0.33 seconds. Okay. How do I mark this? I'll give you a mark for that. I'll give you a mark for the answer. If you don't put your unit, you don't get your mark even if the answer the value wise is correct. Okay. Then you get your final expression. Let's see, I think they've, they've they, this, this was probably broken up here. So they asked for the thevenin equivalent resistance and the time constant. So we've got both of those values, right? So you would have gotten the value for the thevenin equivalent resistance. I usually give a mark for the drawing as well. And then uh, the final expression. So the current is a function of time, which is equals to I0 e to the negative t over tau, is then going to give me um, the initial current, which we calculated to be 1.41 amps. So it will be 1.41 e to the negative t over 0.33. Right, and that should be amps. Again, you get a mark, get a mark for that, for that, and make sure that you've got your units in place. All right, uh, let's see. Questions, Marupeng, you can ask your question. Sir, I was kindly asking why an inductor is an open circuit. Why is the inductor an open circuit? Okay, so it's not really that the inductor is an open circuit per se. I've just removed the inductor from the circuit so that you remember that you are determining the equivalent resistance with respect to, let's call it terminals A, B, if this was A and that is B. Okay, I've just taken out the inductor so that you know 
that your equivalent resistance is with respect to where the inductor was connected. Thank you. Okay. So I usually do this also with RTH. Um, I usually say take out your load resistor so that you don't mistakenly include it in your RTH calculation. Uh, Sitole, you can ask your question. Okay. Um, someone is asking, do you need to know the laws of integration by Thursday? If you look at the questions that we've done, if you look at the um, examples that are there on ULink and uh, on on the Google uh, on the um, on the uh, channel, you'll see that uh, you don't necessarily need to know integration. You remember that integration is the same as the calculation of the area under the graph. We've done a couple of these examples, um, so you can use that as an alternate uh, means to calculate um, if there's an integration that's required. Okay, someone is asking, uh, do you have to put minus 3t um, or Um, so you could also have written this as follows, right? You could have also said this is also equal to 1,41 e to the negative 3t, right? This is also correct. Um, so that's also correct. Okay. Any other question? Someone is asking, when is a resistor bypassed? The resistor is bypassed when there is another alternate path for current to flow, meaning there's a short circuit connected in parallel with that resistor. That is the only condition that will result in a resistor being bypassed. Okay. Okay, good. That is uh, um, the scope of work that was relevant for your uh, other tests. So the other work here, let's see, what is this? Yeah, this is impedance. So we have not done this. This will, this will factor into test three. Those of you that are writing test three and those of you that aren't writing test three, this will factor into your exam. Okay, so that's left now. Okay. Now let's move into the 2020 uh, semester test. Uh, Waylo, you can ask your question. Sir. Yes. I think the, I think this this question is important. They say this KM Dix is, but say Intel said an inductor becomes a short circuit. Um, I'm actually not hearing you properly. Okay, you said. Okay, going back to the to the to the question, the question that we're doing just now. Yeah. You said an inductor becomes a short circuit. So here, the inductor becomes a short circuit. Yeah, can you, can uh, you, can you, yeah. Wait, uh, yeah. you mean, you mean, yeah, yeah, becomes a short circuit, yes? Yes, so in that case, I think the question is, why does the current go to the four, resi four ohm resistor and not bypass it? Oh, okay. Well, because the short circuit still leads you to an eight ohm resistor. 
So in this branch, there's still the presence of an 8 ohm resistor, right? If the short circuit was connected in parallel with the four in, in parallel with the four ohm resistor, then it would have bypassed. But the short circuit uh, ju it just connects uh, this point to that point there. So the current that goes in here will go through the four ohm resistor and through the eight ohm resistor. And in fact, most of the current will be going through the four ohm resistor because the four ohm resistor is less than the eight ohm resistor. Okay. Okay, I think you have answered the question, sir. Uh, KM Dick, you can ask your question. Uh, sir, can you hear me? I can, go ahead. Uh, but, but say, on, on the index, isn't it when, for, for, when we're looking for tau, say, the, the R equivalent, sh shouldn't the inductor become a short circuit instead of an open circuit? It, it, it does. Okay, so let me, let me run through this again. So I, I am not saying here, because I think you guys are getting confused with what I've done here. Yes. Okay, so maybe let, let's do this thing so that it doesn't confuse you. I'm going to put the inductor back there again. I'm not saying that the inductor becomes an open circuit. So let's put it back. And that's A and this is B. Okay, so you can leave it like that. And all you do is you need to determine the equivalent resistance to where your inductor is connected right i just usually take it out so that you can see that it's with respect to those terminals i'm not really replacing it with an open circuit okay so you can if it's if it's going to confuse you just leave the inductor in there and then but you need to be able to see that the 4 ohm is connected in series with the 8 ohm is that fine yes yes i see so yes it's fine okay All right, good, let's move on. Um, okay, so we are now going to look at your 2020 paper. First question, in order to obtain the Norton equivalent current through the load resistor, the load resistor is replaced with a short circuit. Is this true or is this false? Norton current is the load resistor replaced with a open circuit or is it with a short circuit? So is that true or false? I just want to see you guys. You can type on the in the chat group. Is it true or false? Okay, I see the majority of you are saying true. Let's see if this is the case. Okay, so Norton equivalent current is defined as the maximum current through the load resistor. For you to get maximum current, the load resistance must be a minimum, right? What is the minimum resistance? It's zero ohms, which is a short circuit. So indeed, this is true. Okay, next question. The Norton equivalent current and the Norton equivalent resistance can be used to determine the maximum power transfer over the load resistor. True or false? So the Norton current and the Norton resistance can be used to determine the maximum power transfer to the load resistor. most of you are saying true again. Let's see. Norton equivalent current. Norton equivalent current. 
and resistance. You can get the maximum power transfer. So you remember the maximum power transfer is given by VTH squared over 4RTH. So you need VTH and you need RTH. They're saying you have RN, or rather you've got IN, and you've got RN, okay? But you know that RN is equals to RTH, so that's fine. You should also know that IN is VTH divided by RTH, okay? And that's what you see here. So effectively, this becomes IN squared over 4RN cubed, effectively, right? So you can determine your maximum power transfer by using uh, VTH, by using this equation, which is VTH squared over 4RTH, and just replacing RN with RTH, or RTH with RN, and um, I, uh, VTH, which is uh, IN times RTH. Okay, so that's true. Question three, um, how do capacitors and inductors behave under DC conditions? First statement, capacitors are replaced with open circuits with an infinite impedance and inductors are replaced with short circuits with a zero impedance. For now, you can think of impedance as resistance, okay? So you can think of impedance as resistance. So capacitors, yes, are replaced with open circuits. That's correct. And you know that a open circuit has an infinite resistance. So that first part should be true. Second one says capacitors are replaced with short circuits. That's already incorrect. The third one says capacitors are replaced with short circuits again. That's already incorrect um, with an infinite impedance. The second one was short circuits with a zero impedance. So remember what I said is that when any part of a sentence is incorrect, it renders the whole sentence incorrect. So part B says replaced with a short circuit. That's not correct. But the short circuit has zero impedance. Yes, that is correct. The short circuit does have zero impedance, but a capacitor is not a short circuit. Okay, so only A is correct in question three. Question four, <clears throat> which of the following statements is true? Number one, a capacitor stores energy in its electric field. You should know that that's true from our theory. An inductor stores energy in, in its magnetic field. You should know that that's true as well. Capacitors are linear elements. Um, you should know this is not correct. We talked about linearity and why these are not linear elements. Uh, we, we discussed this in, uh, in class. The equivalent capacitance of two series connected capacitors is the arithmetic sum of the capacitor values. Not correct, because the two capacitors that are connected in uh, series is equivalent to two, um, we think of two resistors connected in parallel. So it's not the arithmetic sum, it's not C1 plus C2, right? should be the parallel combination, so the equation for parallel calculation. So only the first two are correct. Next question, which of the following statements are true? A source-free RC response occurs when a source is suddenly connected to a circuit with a capacitor or one or more resistor. So source-free RC is RC, capacitor, resistor, so that last part is correct but it's a source free, so there's no external source, but this says suddenly connected. So it should be saying suddenly disconnected, so that first statement is not correct. Second, a step response of an RL circuit occurs when a source is suddenly connected to a circuit. That is correct. So step response, the source is connected to a circuit. Then they go on to say that circuit has one or more resistors and at least one capacitor. So that's not correct, because well, it's an RL step response, resistor inductor, so it doesn't have a capacitor. So that makes that statement incorrect. Third um, says the time constant of an RC or RL response is the time the response takes to decay by 36.8% of its initial value. That's not correct. It's not by 36.8%, it's to 36.8% of its initial value. Okay? Because if we say by 36.8% of its initial value, you're basically saying it 
decays to um, the, the remainder, which would be 100% minus 30%, which is roughly your 64%, which is not what the time constant is. The last, quit, last part says, when solving step response circuits, the initial conditions and the final conditions and, and the time constant needs to be determined before determining the response. Absolutely, that's entirely correct. Okay, last multiple choice. Which of the following statements is true? A voltage source or a current source can be expressed in the time domain as well as the frequency domain. That's correct. Um, we did that chapter 9.1 to 9.3. Uh, complex numbers incorporate real and non-real numbers. So you wouldn't know this as yet. That's after 9.3. Um, and then under AC conditions, uh, a capacitor is replaced with an open circuit and an inductor with a short circuit. I've mentioned this at the beginning of chapter nine already that this is not the case. A capacitor does not become an open circuit and an inductor a short circuit under AC conditions. So you should know that that's false. And the last part says impedance and admittance are interchangeable. In other words, they are the same. Right, that's not correct. Uh, we'll talk more about this when we're doing the rest of chapter nine after you test. But impedance is the inverse of admittance, just like your conductance is the inverse of your resistance. Right, any questions with the multiple choice? Uh, someone is asking, are sinusoids and phases included in your test? Yes, they are. So chapter 9.1 to 9.3 would be included in your test. Okay, let's uh, continue. Right, so the next part of the question states, uh, okay, so you've got here a circuit and the question reads, well, let's go back to the top, okay, it starts here. Determine the Norton equivalent current and the Norton equivalent resistance. Uh, with respect uh, to terminals A, B, or the circuit below. Okay, so let's take a look at this, pro this problem. Continue it at the bottom here. Okay, so um, we're looking for R N I N. All right, so the first step of this is to get uh, R N. And you know, for you to get R N, 
your load your voltage source becomes a short circuit your current source becomes an open circuit okay and you're looking for the resistance with respect to terminals AB it's 12 that's 40 and that's 20 okay and you should see here that uh, um, you can just cut that out maybe just leave it the way that it is but you should see here that if you put a current in here that current is going to do that it's going to go up here etc so you can see 40 and 20 are in parallel and uh, I'm sorry in series not parallel and then they will be in parallel with the 12 so rn is going to give me 40 plus 20 and that will be in parallel with 12. that will be 60 in parallel with 12. and that will give me 10 ohms Right, and that makes sense. The equivalent resistance should be smaller than the smallest resistance, smaller than 12, that's 10. Okay, that's good. That is um, Rn equal to 10 ohms, and that's usually maybe two marks or so. Okay, and then the next is to get your Norton equivalent current. So let's take this as is, and I want to get my Norton equivalent current. So I should know that for my Norton equivalent current, I need to replace my, uh, wherever the load would have been connected with a short circuit, where this is IN. Okay, and you should then be able to see here that you can simplify the circuit. So first, this should fall away. Because if I've got a current flowing there, the current will always take the path of least resistance, which is the short circuit. So the 12 ohm gets bypassed, number one. Number two, maybe to simplify this circuit, I could also do a um, source transformation of the 3 ohm. Then I don't have a combination of voltage and current sources there. All right, so I could say, and that's just an option to make it a bit easier for myself. So I could say plus minus 18. Uh, so I've got 18 volts, I've got 20 ohms. And then I will have my plus my source and my resistor. And I will have terminals with my short circuit. That's A and that's B. And I'm going to have um, I N sitting at that point, and that will be 40 ohms. <clears throat> okay, and then what will the voltage be? That should be 40 times 3. So 40 times 3 is 4 times 3 is 12. Should be 120 volts. Okay, and ultimately I'm just looking for the current. So the current I N. So I could put these sources together, 18 plus 120 is 138. Actually, no, that's not right. So let's do this. So let's say I start here at zero. If I start here at zero, I increase by 18. So I'm going to be sitting here on positive 18. I'm just considering the sources now. And then I decrease by 120. So I'll be sitting there on um, 18 minus 120. That will be minus 102. Okay. So what does that mean? It means Sorry. that. Yes. It's actually 118, not 18. Is it 180? Yes, sir. 
Okay, thanks for that. Let's take a look. Is it 180, 180? 180, yes, that's correct. Oh, it's not 80. It's not 80. So, where's the 12 ohm resistor? Okay, so you've got here positive 180. Okay, and then you take away 120. Okay, you take away 120, um, that will be uh, 60. All right, so that will be positive 60 left. So ultimately, what I then have here is a source that will be plus or minus, uh, plus and minus 60 volts. And then I'm going to have your 20 ohm, your 40 ohm, and my short circuit that sits there. That's 20, and that's 40. All right. And my current, IN, must then give me the total voltage, 60 volts divided by 40 plus 20. So 40 plus 20. So that's 60 divided by 60, which then gives me 1 amp. That is your IN. And I think that's what the question asked for. So they asked for you to determine your uh, your, your current. So I mean, these were multiple options, and that was there basically was none of the above. There you can see it's one amp. Um, there was a different approach that was done here uh, than what we did, but we, we uh, but we got to the one amp anyway, so that should be fine. So you've got the one amp final answer. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. Okay, the next one is, uh, I think is, is quite uh, worth focusing some time on. So this one, they're asking you to determine the uh, thermal increment resistance that can be transferred to R given that VTH is 2 volts. Determine the thermal equivalent resistance RTH and the maximum power transfer. Okay, so thermal equivalent resistance. Okay, good. All right, so um, let's plot that one. So the question says, determine the thevenin equivalent resistance with respect to the terminals R. So they're saying that is your load resistor. Determine the thevenin equivalent resistance with respect to terminals R. So what will we do there? Right, for you to get RTH, you know that for maximum power transfer, R must give you RTH, and you're going to find RTH. So what do you do to get RTH? Your Your voltage sources would become short circuit. That will be with respect to that terminal, so that stays like that. Your current source will become an open circuit. So your 5 ohm will sit there, and that's also a short circuit like that. And that over there is an open circuit. That's 5, and that's 3, and that's 2. Right. Um, and you should be able to see that, again, with respect to the terminals you're looking at, so let's call the, the, the terminals, the load resistor, I'm just going to call it A and B here, so you don't lose your reference point. So with respect to terminals A, B, you should see that if I pump a current here, different color, if I pump a current here, a current will split, right? 
and that current should be the same as the current that comes in today. So the 3 ohm and the 5 ohm are in series with each other, but the combination is in parallel with the 2 ohms, which tells me that RTH is going to give me 3 plus 5 in parallel with 2. So it's 8 in parallel with 2. Gives me 1.6 ohms. Okay. Uh, that's the first part. And the second part would then be to determine the maximum power transfer. So what would the maximum power transfer be? So in this question, I think they gave you the voltage. So let's go take a look. I think they said, given that VTH is two volts, so you've been given VTH. So given that VTH is two volts, so VTH is equal to two volts, therefore Pmax is equal to VTH squared over 4RTH, which is going to give me 2 squared over 4 times 1, 6, 6. And that gives me... Uh, Zero point six three zero comma six three watts. It's my final answer there. Okay, any questions on this one? I think it was pretty straightforward. Are we going to include the value of the load resistor if it was given to calculate the maximum power transfer? Um, no. Uh, so if remember, the maximum power transfer occurs when the load resistor is equal to RTH. And that's what we've used in the equation, right? VTH squared over 4 RTH. So maximum power transfer means you use the value of RTH for your load resistor. Okay. Uh, Senyani, you can ask your question. Okay, Mangena, you can ask your question. Uh, so, how do we confirm that uh, when calculating the maximum power transfer how do we confirm that we are doing the right thing when you, when determining maximum power transfer how do you confirm what that we are doing the right thing the correct thing the answer is correct uh, normally must ways to calculate something and we, uh, we use right. so, so there, there isn't so really check. Yeah, there isn't really a, you know, a way. So your question is, what's the sanity check that I can follow here to see that my answer is correct? Yeah. Um, and ultimately, what, what should be happening is that, because maximum power transfer would imply that uh, the highest value of, of power is being transferred uh, to, to that circuit, right? But essentially what that means, I mean, this is just an equation, right? So you need to make sure that your VTH and your RTH are correct. That's what you need to check. There's not really a sanity check that you're going to have here. Yeah. You need to make sure that you've calculated this correctly in terms of your Norton current, and you need to make sure you've calculated your, um, you know, your Thevenin equivalent voltage correctly. And that's where you can have, you know, uh, your your checks. In this case, they didn't ask you to calculate VTH, but when you do that, you would have your checks. 
Okay, thank you. All right, let's move on. Okay, so the next question, um, I think this one should be quite easy. I'm not going to redraw it and so forth. The answer is also here for it. We'll just talk through it. You're given a capacitor circuit and they're asking you to get the equivalent capacitance. So first of all, you should see that that capacitor and that capacitor are connected in parallel. These three are connected in parallel to each other and those four are connected in parallel to each other. So you can combine those two just by adding the capacitance. One plus one gives you two. Two plus two plus two gives you six. And three plus three plus three plus three gives you 12. All right? And then once you've got the series combination, then you know that the series connected capacitors is like you've got parallel connected resistors. So the equivalent capacitance will then be 12 in parallel with 6 in parallel with 2, right? And 12 in parallel with 6 will give you 4. 4 in parallel with 2 will give you 1.3. So the equivalent capacitance will be 1.33 microfarads. Don't forget the unit. Don't lose marks for simple things. Okay, next question. Determine the equivalent inductance for this circuit. So this one is uh, somewhat interesting. So if you look at this circuit, you should note there that you've got delta connection that exists. Right? And you could convert that delta to a Y. Someone asked this in class at some point. But before you do that, check for series and parallel. So, for instance, you should be able to see here that you've got 8 and 12 that are in series with each other. Sorry, 8 and, yeah, 8 and 12 that are in series with each other to give you uh, 20, right? So, 20 will be, so 8 plus 12 would be 20. That would be sitting in parallel with the 5 millihenry. So, that will be 20 in parallel with 5, which gives you 4. Same thing at the bottom here. You've got 4 in series with 8 to give you 12, and the 12 will be in parallel with 6. 12 in parallel with 6 also gives you 4. Okay. Once you've got that, the 4 and this 4 will be in series with each other because whatever current, whatever current will be going, whatever current will be going there, will go down there. So this 4 and this 4 are in series with each other, right? And that 4 and 4 give you the 8 that you see here, and it's in parallel with that 8. 8 in parallel with 8, you know, should give you 4, and then that will be in series with the 6 and the 10. So the equivalent will then be 8 in parallel with 8, plus 10 plus 6, which then gives you 20 millihenries as your final answer. Okay, so that should be that should be um, you know easy calculations, and this will be there in your test. You'll be requested to calculate equivalent inductance, equivalent capacitance. Any questions there? Um, sir. Yes. Um, when dealing with uh, inductors and capacitors, when we are required to find the equivalent inductance or capacitance, do we treat them uh, the same way as we treat the white deltas when we have a balanced circuit? Yes, we do. Okay, thanks. Okay, next question. Determine the voltage and the current, voltage across the capacitor, current through the inductor, and the energies WC and WL for the circuit. So this is under DC conditions. 
Okay, so in this circuit, you should know that under DC conditions, capacitor becomes an open circuit and the inductor becomes a short circuit. We've done this question in class actually. And we're looking for IL and we're looking for VC. So let's start off with uh, VC. VC is the voltage across the capacitor. So it's the voltage from this point all the way to that point. So you know that this is zero, that's zero, that's zero there. It's a short circuit. That's zero there and that's zero there. So that should tell you that the voltage across the capacitor is zero volts. And by extension, the energy across the capacitor, which is a half, CV squared will then give me zero joules. Okay, what about the inductance? What about IL? If I'm looking for IL, I should be able to see that I've got a current six that splits to that and that. So I can use current division. So I can say the current that is through the inductor is going to give me 4 over 4 plus 2 multiplied by, so it's 4 over 4 plus 2 multiplied by 6. And that gives me 24 over 6. And that gives me 4 amps. And does this make sense? I've got a total of 6 amps, so this cannot be more than 6 amps because it's feeding from 6 amps. And the current through the 2 ohm should be the majority of the current because it's the smallest resistor. So 4 of the 6 amps is coming to the load resistor. So that makes sense to me. And then if I'm looking for the omega L is a half L I squared, which is going to give me a half and the inductance value is 0 0.5. So that's times a half times four squared. Okay, 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times four squared. That gives me four joules. Okay, answer and unit. Okay, and don't forget your formulas, all right? If, if, for example, you made a mistake here, at least you can come back and we can give you a mark for the equation and maybe you got the answer wrong. But if you gamble and you just write the final answers, you gambling with your marks. Okay, let's see if there's any questions. There's a question here that says, how do you add polar sinusoids using the Casio calculator? You don't have to do that for this paper yet. We're going to do that after the, after the test. Uh, Mampa, you can ask your question. Mampa, you can ask your question. Okay, I think we'll continue. In in Thursday's paper, you're writing from nine point one, section nine point okay. one to section nine point three. Nine. 
So I wanted to ask about the voltage across the capacitor. What about it? Uh, I don't understand why it is zero. You don't understand what? I don't understand why the voltage across the capacitor is zero. Can you please explain? Okay. The inductor is replaced with a short circuit, whilst the capacitor is replaced with an open circuit, right? Um, if you look through the circuit. Yeah, I understand that one. Okay. So you've got zero yes. volts at this point. It's a short circuit from here all the way to the top here. That means the voltage at this point is zero. What about the voltage at this point? Well, you don't have any current flowing through here. So the voltage drop across here, this is the only place where you could have dropped voltage. Yeah. But that voltage is equal to the current times the resistance. And the current is zero, so the voltage drop is going to give me zero. That means the voltage on top here will also be zero, and that will be zero. So the voltage at positive is zero, the voltage at the negative is zero. So the voltage drop across the capacitor will be zero. Does that make sense? Okay, so yeah, if I, I apply kickoff voltage law, maybe I can understand more. Yeah, you can do that as well. Okay, sir, thank you. Okay. So you can apply KVL around here. So you can say minus the voltage across the capacitor, and then you go across, then you're going to say, um, you can say minus the voltage of the resistor gives me zero. So the voltage across the capacitor is equal to minus the voltage of the resistor, but that is equal to I times R and I is equal to zero, so VC is equal to zero volts. That would be your KVL analysis. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so the other questions here um, are not really applicable except the last one, and we will address the question uh, of the one student on adding sinusoids. I'll show you how to do that as well. Because there is a way you can do that using the using the methods that we have done to date. Okay, the last question uh, is as follows. It says, if V1 is 10 cos 2t plus 30 degrees and V2 is 5 sin of 2t minus 80 degrees, which of the statements is true okay so and what you can do here is just give me so v1 so v1 is equals to 10 cos of 2t plus 30 degrees and v2 is equals to 5 sun of 2t minus 80 degrees okay so determine which signal is in front which one is behind and by how much so i want you guys to work on that with me uh, we can first change that sign to cause Correct. So Correct. go ahead. Um, determine. So changing the positive sign. To, yeah. So you can you can convert so it. I want you to once you're done and you've checked which one is leading and lagging, you can indicate in the chat group. 
indicate which one you say is leading so like correct the
Okay, let's see uh, what you guys have answered. V1 legs, V2 by 160 degrees. Legs, V2 leads by 160. Good. Let's uh, quickly take a look at that. So V1 is equals to 10 cos 2t plus 30. So it's the standard um, format. So you can just quickly get that in phase of form. So that's 10 angle 30 degrees. V2, which is 5 sin of 2t minus 80 degrees, is going to be 5 cos of 2t minus 80 degrees. And it's a positive sign. So you should know that you need to subtract 90 degrees. So V2 is going to give me 5 cos of 2t minus 80 minus 90 will be minus um, 100 and 70 degrees. Minus 80 minus 90, 90 to 70 minus 170 degrees. Okay, then I say select a reference. Right, that's the method, right? Select reference angle or select reference. So I'm going to say I want V1 to be my reference. Then I'll say the change in angle delta theta is going to give me theta V1 minus theta V2, which is going to give me 30 minus minus 170 degrees which gives me um, 30 plus 170 which gives me 210 degrees okay and that is positive right now can I say, therefore, that V1 leads V2 by 210 degrees? Can I say this? Hey. Uh, and it, yeah, it should, be, it should be 200. Yeah, correct. So can I say that? Can I say V1 leads V2 by 200 degrees? Okay, so I can see most of you <clears throat> are aware that your delta theta, which is important, must not be between always be between minus 180 degrees and positive 180 degrees. And this is sitting at 200, so it's outside of that region. So I need to either add or subtract 360 degrees so that this is back in the region. And obviously, to get it back to this region, I can't add 360. It's going to take it further away. So I need to say 200 minus 360, which then takes me back to minus 160 degrees. Okay, so now that I've got that minus 160 degrees, then I can go back again and I can, uh, I can conclude, right? So it's negative. That means V1 lags, the reference lags the other one, V2, and it lags it by 160 degrees. Okay. And that can also imply that V2 leads V1 by 160 degrees. Okay. Now, there was a question from the one student that said, if you need to add phases, how would you do it? Okay. So, um, 10 angle 30. So, if I said here, V1 plus V2, for example. Then I want the final answer in the time domain. That would be uh, 10 angle 30 plus uh, and, and this would be and that's the phaser. That would be 5 angle minus 170 degrees. 
okay? So for you to add phases, the angular frequency must be the same. Okay, so that this 2t and 2t, this, this must be the same, otherwise you can't add them. Okay, and okay, once you've got them to that form, then um, this will will we'll not evaluate it. We will cover it in the in the next class. But effectively, your calculator allows you to do this. You can go to complex mode, and then you can say ten. I usually put this in brackets. So bracket ten. Then I use the angle sign, which is that angle thirty plus. Five angle negative one seven zero gives me an answer. Then I would move this answer to polar form. And that gives me five point five seven angle forty seven point eight. Okay, if you're not if you're not comfortable or if you're not sure about this, then you know this is actually just uh, this is actually just Pythagoras. You've got r equal to 10, and the angle is 30, and you've got the same thing here. 5, and the angle is just minus. Just maybe you do this. The angle is, let's put it, minus 170 degrees, and that is fine, okay? So you can break this into its x and y component, into its x and y component, add x to x, add y to y, and then take it back to um, the equivalent one, and that equivalent one will be what you have here, right? Otherwise, you just add it with your calculator. And if they wanted this back in the time domain, now you're going to say the voltage as a function of time is going to give me the magnitude 5.57 cos of 2t plus 47.8 degrees, and that will be in volts. That would be now the addition of the two, the final signal, which would be the addition of the two. Yeah, so that answers one of the questions one of you had, but it won't be evaluated for test. It will be evaluated for test three. All right, that is uh, that's all the relevant questions for for test two. Okay, we should have covered everything. All right. Okay, so I need uh, to check. Okay. All right, I just need all of you to uh, please just complete this form. dropping it in the group right so just uh, please complete the form uh, just to give feedback on the session that we've just done now um, so that link that I've, I've indicated there Um, and then, uh, yeah, any other questions? Anyone with any other questions? Are we all happy?
I missed this question. So let's take a look at this question. Okay, just complete those of you. I see there's quite a number of you that haven't completed the review form yet. Uh, complete the review form. Test will be out of 50, not 60. Uh, the session is recorded, yes. As soon as it's available, I will share it with you guys. Okay, the uh, question that uh, the student is leading us to should be similar to the question that you've just done. I'll quickly run through it. Uh, V1, 20 cos omega t plus uh, 60 degrees. So V1 phaser is equals to 20 angle 60. Okay, V2 is equals to negative 30 sine, so it would be 30 cos of omega t minus 30 plus 90 degrees which then gives me 30 cos of omega t minus 30, minus 30 plus 90 gives you minus 60, plus 60 degrees. Okay, so V2 is 30 and that will be the phasor angle 60. Okay, and V phasor one is 20 angle 60 all right if you were to plot these two all right the one has a magnitude of that the one is a magnitude of 20 so it maybe goes like that and the angle is 60 but the magnitude is 20 okay that would be call it v f1 the other one I'm going to do it in black. Has a magnitude of 30. And that would be VF2. But they're both sitting on top of each other. Okay, they're directly sitting on top of each other. So neither one would lead or lag. They're basically sitting exactly, they're running, they, they are at the same point. It's like two people that have taken off at the same time and running at the same speed. No one is in front of anyone, right? But you can also check this. So you can say select V1 as ref. So um, delta theta 1 is going to give me theta V1 minus theta V2, which gives me 60 minus 60 which then gives me zero. So V1 is in phase with V2. That means it doesn't lead or lag. Or you can say V1 leads V2 by zero degrees if you want to. Okay. Okay, there's still some of you that haven't uh, filled in the form, complete the form. Uh, someone says, please do the last question of the class test. Okay, so the 
question read, determine the 7 and equivalent voltage for the circuit. So determine VTH. Okay, so that's 7 and equivalent voltage, maximum voltage over the load resistor. And that happens when you replace your um, your load resistor with an open circuit, which has already happened. So you're looking for the voltage here, VTH, which is equals to VAB, which is equals to VA minus VB. So this is actually a bit of an interesting question. So I would start off by saying I'm going to define this as my ground point. So that's my zero point, right? That's zero over there. If this is zero, I then increase by 10. So I'm sitting here on positive 10, which then tells me that VB is actually equal to positive 10 volts. Okay. I've got VB. I need VA. Then I can just say VA minus VB gives me VTH. I should also be able to see here that if this is VA, the current flowing through here is zero and the voltage here should still also be VA. So I need the voltage at that point. Right. So let us um, do a KCL. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna select two points. I'm gonna call this point V um, you could do source transformation to make this a voltage source in series with a resistor. Then you have, you don't have two separate nodes to do um, KCL on. It may simplify things. I'm just going to keep it the way that it is for now. So I'm going to say, um, uh, I'm going to say KCL node V, right? So in this node, I'm going to say that current, I'm just going to say all of them are going out. So 2 amps is going out. So 2 plus V over 10 plus V minus VA over 10 gives me 0. That's my first equation. And then in the second loop, and I suppose I can stretch this, I can figure that out. So that will be common denominator of 10 times 2, so that will be 20 plus uh, V plus V minus VA gives me 0. So that basically says 2V minus uh, VA, or rather, let's say 20 is equals to VA minus 2V. Okay, that's your first equation, right? And then I can say KCL node VA. So what's happening here? So here I'm going to say all the currents are going in. So I'm going to say 2 amps plus V minus VA over 10 plus 3 gives me 0. So 20 plus V minus VA plus 30 gives me 0. So 50 is equals to um, VA minus V. And that's my second equation. And I'm going to plug that into my calculator. So I'm going to say mode, I say equation. That's the two linear equations, so it's 1. So uh, the first one is VA and V. So it's 1 and minus 2. So 1 minus 2, that gives me 20. The next one is, again, 1 minus 1 gives me 50. And then I get VA as 80. Okay, the, um, 
calculates, I just crashed, but I, all I needed was VA anyway. Then I'm going to say, v, therefore, VTH, we said was equals to VA minus VB. That's going to be 80 minus 10. And that's going to give me 70 months. Okay, so that was the last question. All right, I hope that's clear. How to convert to polar form when using the calculator? Um, not really important. Uh, Uh, for you for the test that you're writing. So uh, I don't think you need to worry about that. Okay, so someone's asked uh, for more previous question papers. So I think your, 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 uh, your two question papers should be sufficient. From there, you can look at questions at the back of the book. You can look at uh, your questions uh, also that are in your workbook, right? Then usually that should be sufficient. Okay. Any other questions um, before we call it? I think we've actually reached the end of the time. But are there any other questions? Those of you that haven't filled in the uh, feedback, uh, complete the feedback. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, Itachi, you can answer, uh, ask your question. Hi. Uh, so regarding the maximum power cell, if the if our load resistor is not equal to to be thevenin resistance, how are we going to do about that cell? Just repeat again, if the load resistance is if the load resistance that is given on the on the question is not equal to the feminine resistance that we've calculated. Are we going to add the the resist the, the resistance that are not equal? Yes. So um so your question is uh, ultimately what would the power be, right? So when we talk about maximum power, you must remember that uh Maximum power is can only occur when the load resistor is equal to the Thevenin equivalent resistance or Norton resistance, right? So we don't talk of maximum power if that condition is not met, right? But mm -hmm. it, they, the, the question could be asked, um, well, the load resistor is not equal to RTH. What is then the maximum power transfer, right? Then mm -hmm. if you've got a VTH circuit, um, if you've got a circuit that looks like this, Um, if you've got a circuit that maybe looks yeah like uh, that, that's your beat. If you've got a circuit that uh, looks as follows, and that's VTH and that's RTH, right? Yes. And you've got the resistor RL, which is your load resistor, okay? Yes. Then obviously your load, let's call, let, let's put some numbers here. So VTH is 10 volts, okay? RTH, let's call this 5 ohms, and then let's call RL 2 ohms, okay? So the question yes, is sir. B, what is the power that's going through the load resistor, okay? So it's just power, right? Power is equals to voltage times current, correct? Or yes, it's equals to squared times resistor RL. You could also use that equation. So you need to get 
either the voltage and the current, or you need to get um, you need to get uh, the uh, yeah, maybe let's let's start with that right. VTH. So the maximum. So so what would IN be? <clears throat> IN is the current through the load resistor when the load resistor is a short circuit. So IN when this is a short circuit would be 10 volts divided by 5. So IN would be 10 divided by 5, which gives me 2 amps. And that is the maximum current. Okay? Yes, yes. That would be broken to um, that load resistor if it's a short circuit. Now, the resistor is not a short circuit, it's 2 ohms, right? So I should yes, expect sir. the current to be less. So IL same or similar equation it should be the total voltage which is 10 volts divided by not only five now it will be five plus, five plus two, two. So 10 over One seven two. correct yeah so it's 10 divided by seven which gives me 2.8 right and that two point just give me a second 10 divided by a larger seven. resistor uh, seven 10 divided by 7 gives me 1.42, right? Which is less than the maximum current, as you can see, right? Yes, sir. All right. Once you've got that current, that is now referred to as the load current, the current that's flowing through the load. You could also okay. use voltage division to get the voltage over the load. Or you can just simply use the I squared R. So I can say the power through the load resistor is equals to I squared R L, which is going to give me 1,42 squared times the load resistor, which is uh, uh, two. two. Right. And that should give you, if I square that, multiply that by two, gives me 4,08, 4,08 watts. Okay. Do you expect, okay. so this is the power that went to the load resistor when the value of the load resistor was not equal to RTH, right? Okay. So would you expect yes. this power to be, would you expect this power to be more or less than the power when RTH is equal to RL? What are you expecting in terms of the power when RTH is equal to RL? I must I expect the power to be the same, sir. The same as what? The same as this? No, like the, the power that uh, the RL dissipates must be the same as the power that the RTH dissipates because they be equal. Okay, correct. I, I agree with you. But when you compare it to this power, are you expecting it to be less, more? How are you, what, what, what's the relationship? I expect it to be more, sir. Right, right. Because the maximum power transfer is then going to be the VTH squared over 4RTH. If this power is less than this power, I'll be very shocked because that's why they define this as maximum power transfer. So VTH yes, squared yes. is what is 10. So that will be 10 squared over four times RTH, which was five, right? So that's going to yes, be sir. 100 divided by 20, which gives you five watts. Five so the watts. maximum power is five watts. Telling you that what you were doing is you were not charging your load at maximum. You are charging your load somewhere there at, at 4,8, right? You're charging it there somewhere at 4,8 yes, with a resistance of 2 ohms True. for the load resistor. The moment you yes. make your resistor equal to 5 ohms, which is equal to RTH, then you're charging at the maximum point, which is okay. the 5 watts. Okay, so that okay. would be the 4,8 zero eight watts and that would be the five watts does five that make sense watts. yes so in conclusion so we're going to to utilize the into the art into the load resistance if the rth is not equal to the rl the r the r the, r, the, r, the specific that specific rate of rl we must use it so they can find the maximum power that passes through it or that it dissipates it yeah correct thank you very much sir all right okay good um any other questions
All right. I think, yeah, I think that that should bring us to the, the end of our session. Uh, um, so I think for, yeah, to make sure you go through again these uh, examples that we've done in preparation for tomorrow. Uh, remember when, uh, in the Thursday or other, remember that when you're writing your paper, you must always, you know, have a strategy. So write, you know, start with the stuff that you best understand, um, you know, um, so I mean, Go, go through. If I, if I was looking at your paper, I would probably start with the DC analysis of capacitors. That's easy work. I would then look at your sinusoidal circuits. That's usually easy work to go through. Um, I would look at your um, uh, chapter seven, uh, which is your time varying sources. So your um, what's this thing? Your source free and your step response circuits. And then I would most probably finish off with my Thevenin and Norton equivalent circuit. That's how I would probably do the thing. And that's what you need to also look at when you're doing the paper. Start off with sections that you know you're more strong in doing. Uh, you know, the longer you're doing a paper, the more tired you become, the more prone you are to making mistakes. So you want to start where you're strong first and make sure you get the marks. And remember, most of the question is you either know it or you don't. So there's no... Uh, half marks or quarter marks or whatever may be the case, you need to make sure that you are fully, perfectly answering the question. Okay, if you if you, if you don't get the marks right, you're probably losing 80% of those marks, I would say. All right, so you need to make sure when you're doing the question. All right, good luck to all of you for, uh, for, Thursday, uh, for Thursday. I will post uh, these notes and uh, this recording uh, later on tonight. Uh, someone is asking where you are writing. You're writing in the same venue as uh, where we have our classes and our tutorials. So everyone needs to come to the venue. Okay, I will I will post the uh, the test two as well, so that you've got uh, answer, you've got some guidance in that. All right. Good. Enjoy your evening, everyone. Um, see you all on Thursday. Practice and be ready for the test. Time, what time? It's going to be your same, uh, the tutorial time. It was indicated. So make sure you get there in time for your tutorial session. That's going to be the, the time for your test as per your timetable. So make sure you're in class by uh, just before, I'll say 20 to uh, 20 to 10, you should be in class. We should be starting shortly after that. In fact, by half past nine, make sure you come to the venue. Okay. All right. Take care, everyone. Uh, good night.